All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Blueprint Leadership Podcast. I'm K. Wright, your 18th Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force. You all know the drill. We talk to some of my favorite people and we discuss all things leadership. Now, our goal is to provide insights for up and comers to help find their path and reach their leadership potential. We call it Blueprint, but there's no one way to lead. We want to share our experiences, give advice, and hopefully we can help you find your path and reach your potential as a leader. From the time you're born, you're never alone. Someone is always by your side. Family, friends, teachers, strangers, those to your left and to your right. What I have realized is that the older you get, the more choices for company you have. And those whom you choose as your company will shape the course of your life. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Blueprint Leadership Podcast. I'm Kay Wright, your 18th Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force. You know the drill. We talk to some of my favorite leaders from across the world, and we discuss all things leadership. Now, our goal is to provide insights, tips, and ultimately to help us uh, help up and comers find their path and reach their leadership goals. We call it Blueprint, but as we all know, there's no one way to lead. We want to share our experiences, give advice, and hopefully we can help you find your path and reach your potential to be the greatest leader that you can be. Now, our guest for today is someone who I grew up in the Air Force with. We became, we started our command chief real leadership journeys uh, at the same time. Uh, he is a warrior who uh, started off in the Air Force as a PJ, a pararescue jumpman. Uh, he's worked with special forces in all different agencies, a combat veteran, uh, he's been a command chief at multiple levels. Levels. It is an honor to have him here with us. Uh, he is a personal friend of mine and someone that I've relied on uh, for advice, guidance, and mentorship for many, many years. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our SEAC number four, the senior enlisted advisor to the chairman, uh, number four, DZ Ramon Colon Lopez. Hey, man, thanks for being here with us. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah. Really an honor to be here. Yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good to have you. Now, our listeners might remember from our first show, uh, you actually called in. So you're actually, man, our first uh, return guest. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I am. Yeah, yeah, thank you. It was good. Uh, you know, the first show we talked to uh, SEAC number three, and uh, we had you call in, and, and, and that was a, a really good show. It's been received uh, real well. Hey, let's jump right into... Uh, some leadership stuff. Tell me about your leadership journey, man. How, how'd you get here? How'd you become the first airman to become uh, the SEAC? Well, it all starts with my desire to uh, to join the armed forces. And uh, that desire at the time was just to get the hell out of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Yeah. Uh, didn't really have a, a charted path per se. But I quickly realized, and my sister reminded me of this, that I sent her a letter from basic training when they made me a, a squad leader at the time that told her that that leadership position really fulfilled my needs of being in service. So I guess that that was the, the first indicator that I had a passion for leadership. Then I became a transportation specialist, did that for a few years, um, almost uh, acted my way out of the Air Force during that uh, tenure. <laughs> and somebody had the right idea that we should make this young man a pararescue man. He's got too much energy. Yeah. And uh, that was when everything came together. You know, that was the defining moment in my life to where I realized that I wanted to serve 30 years, that I wanted to be a chief in the Air Force, and that I just wanted to continue to serve. Yeah. Could you ever see yourself when you were a young transportation specialist or when you first became a PJ, did you ever see yourself being the most senior enlisted person in the whole United States Department of Defense? <laughs> well, I think if you were to ask my supervisors at the time, <laughs> much like you, they will yeah. give you a different story. Yeah. Um, but no, I think that we're a product of the people that are around us. And like I stated during my uh, sworn in, you know, it, it's all about the company you keep, mm -hmm. uh, the people to your left and to your right. And I have been fortunate enough to have a lot of good teachers to uh, help me carry on with uh, with my duty. Yeah. So speaking of good teachers, um, 
any any particular mentors or folks that stand out in your career that that helped you uh, along your leadership journey? Yeah, so I, I call this uh, four gentlemen the Mount Rushmore of uh, of leadership, mm-hmm. and uh, obviously it's uh, Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force Number Five, Bob Geller, whom yeah. I had the honor to meet early on when I was a senior airman. Um, uh, Jim Binnaker, Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force Number Nine. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was another one that I met later in my life, but uh, clearly helped me shape my leadership style by looking at the, the general purpose side of things and not the special operations side. Uh, I had my first uh, wing commander who selected me and took a huge risk, General now AFSOC Commander Jim Slife. Mm-hmm. And obviously, Chief Master Sergeant retired Wayne Fisk, you know, who grabbed me as a young pirate rescue man right about in the same time that uh, Chief Gaylor uh, came into my life and uh, just not taught me how to be a warrior and uh, be a gentleman. Yeah. So what would you, so clearly you've had uh, at least four um, mentors and folks that have helped helped you along your journey. What advice would you give to uh, young up and coming leaders in, in our armed forces about the power of mentorship or how to go about finding a good mentor? Hey, man, silver bullet number one, if you want to fly with the eagles, don't hang around with the turkeys. <laughs> you know, you eventually become the company that you keep. And I think it's imperative to pay close attention to the people that are around you, good or bad. Learn from the good ones, also learn from the bad ones, and then uh, continue to emulate those, uh, those attributes that you value and continue to be the change that you want to see. Yeah, but, but how, like, how do I go about uh, finding a mentor? Should I just go up and ask someone, hey, SEAC, would you be my mentor? I mean, what's the, what what, what do you think? Uh, especially, you know, our generation of airmen now that may not be as comfortable with that face-to-face interaction. What would you recommend? Well, you know, talking about the face-to-face interaction, I believe that, yeah, many people shy away from it. But one thing that I know for sure is that a lot of them are reading. You know, they're reading posts, they're reading tweets, Mm -hmm. um, they're reading content online. And if they read something from someone whom they want to learn more, I I highly recommend that they reach out to them electronically if they want to. Um, For me personally, I'm open to anyone contacting me, which happens on a daily basis. And that is because they either read something that I wrote in the past or they recently found out about, you know, who I am by position or so on. But... I've always kept the door open for that reason because the four gentlemen that I mentioned earlier, that's exactly what they did for me, and it's my my time to pay it back. Dude, so first of all, nobody recently found out who you are. Everybody knows <laughs> CC. <laughs> uh, uh, but you did mention <laughs> earlier Silver Bullet, and you mentioned uh, just a second ago. You know, people have read things that that you've written, and and so you're you're pretty famous for your leadership series uh, titled Carnivore Leadership. And uh, tell me, you know, where, where, where does that come from and, and what motivated you or got you writing about leadership in, in that way? How many, how, many, uh, ser- how many episodes did you or what yeah. do you call them? Uh, what, volumes. Volumes, yeah. yeah. I, I, I did five of them. Five, yeah. And uh, so they started when I was the command chief at the first special operations wing. But I have to walk you back prior to that assignment because I didn't have any desire to be a command chief. Mm. And it just so happens that at a, a, an award ceremony, Gen, uh, Chief Roy was talking to General Worcester, the AFSAC commander at the time, about uh, the potential of getting some uh, special tactics, now special warfare airmen in the command chief ranks. When he approached me and asked me, I basically told him to pack sand. I didn't have any interest in doing it. And you told Chief Roy that? Yes. The Chief Master in the Air Force? Yes. Number 16? <laughs> Number 16. Right. Fairly large man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, and uh, I had a relationship with him, so I was pretty comfortable talking to him. But he explained that, you know, there's certain attributes from the special operations community that are much needed to be able to lead in combat today. And he was also concerned about what was going to happen 10 years from that date when it comes to the pressure on the force because combat was going to continue to happen and he had seen it during his tenure, which is something that you're dealing with right Mm now. But uh, when when he brought up that comment about we need something different, when it comes to leadership, I went ahead and called the Mount Rushmore of uh, leadership and I asked their opinion. So he said, should I leave the pararescue ranks to become a command chief? And... Unanimously, they say yes. 
you have to do this because uh, Wayne Fisk uh, specifically quoted Paul Airy, said, never pass up an opportunity to pay back the institution that made you who you are. Yeah. So Wayne told me you have to pay back the Air Force. So when I got in the seat, I had uh, my initial conversation with General Slife, and we started talking about what was it that he needed to get done uh, leadership-wise. And he's told several stories, which we will not get into in the in this podcast. But the one thing that he mentioned was that the airmen needed some different kind of motivation and that this was a, a war fighting wing. And I needed to go ahead and bring their focus back from the daily uh, gripes and complaints to a wartime focus. When I met with some of our fellow chiefs, I got to see um, that it was pretty much you know, the mouthpiece of reading whatever the chief master general of the Air Force was putting out, whatever was in Air Force times. And very few had original thoughts about things. And the other thing that I noticed is that few or none of them were talking about their candid personal, you know, opinion or mm -hmm. views on the subjects that were near and dear to the airmen. So I took a chance and I wrote the first one. And it was it was very positive feedback. It was mm -hmm. like about time somebody starts talking from the trenches. So the the second one came out at the time to where we were um, we were thinking about redoing the EPRs, and then the whole fitness uh, mm -hmm. issue came into uh, into play. So I started writing on the subjects that they had the most interest. And since I, I'm not a social media guy, I wasn't putting that on Facebook or I think MySpace was, you know, uh, was probably, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> um, but I decided to just put it in papers and then I disseminated it to the wing. And then we had conversations about that to provide a little bit uh, deeper context. But up to this day, I, ha I have Ehrman writing back saying, hey, uh, can you tell me a little bit more about this paper, what you wrote? But yeah, and that's that's where they came about. Well, I tell you, Ben, it's been a great success. I first, uh, you 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 may have disseminated it to your wing, but it spread across the Air Force pretty quickly. I think I was uh, when I, in my first maybe a few months as a command chief, uh, somebody started sending them to me, and I thought, wow, man, this is some some really good stuff. So, uh, <laughs> and it stood the test of time because I mean, this was probably seven, eight, twenty eleven year, years ago. Yeah, yeah twenty eleven when, when you wrote those. So, uh, man, it's good. Now, you've had a lot of experience in the joint environment, and obviously the job that you're in now, you're responsible for um, all of our the enlisted service members across all of the, um, the, the military services to include the Coast Guard, as well as uh, perhaps in a few days, the Space Force. But what, tell me what's different about leading in the joint environment than just within United States Air Force. Well, you know, lead, leadership is, is the same regardless of what you do. It's getting people to accomplish the mission in, sim in the simplest of terms. The difficult part is tailoring your leadership style to the culture of each service. Mm. So you have to have an understanding on how they think and what makes them react to the orders placed upon them. And I think that any leader that takes the time to understand other service cultures outside of any computer, you know, join PME program, um, I think that they will be wildly successful if, if, if they are placed in a position of responsibility that includes soldiers, sailors, airmen, marine, and coast guardsmen. Yeah. Um, what would you tell, uh, uh, well, first let me ask this. Uh, do you think you, you so what, what do you got in now? Uh, I'm, at, I'm almost at 31. You're about 30, 30 years in, 30? 20, 29 years. 29, okay. 10 days ago. Yeah. Is the Air Force different? Yeah, we didn't have internet when I first came <laughs> in. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's different. But you know, the funny thing is that the gray beards back in the day used to look at us and say, hey, you guys don't understand how it used to be, you know, back in the day. Yeah. What's the thing? Well, back in the day, so it's going to be a constant. Right. You know, there's always going to be uh, new developments, new technology. Uh, the the culture of our people is going to continue to change with the time. So we just got to remain flexible to be able to make the mission work. Yeah. I think one thing that's probably the same is we still recruit just like we did when you yes. and I came in. We still recruit, you know, highly motivated, innovative, creative uh, people that have high aspirations and, and want to do well. Uh, there's probably a lot of people who want to know, hey, man, what should I be doing now as a young airman, soldier, sailor, Marine, Coast Guardsman? 
um, if I wanted to follow in your footsteps? Like what, what are the things at, at that they should be doing that will ultimately lead to success? Well, wa- walking in footsteps, I much rather like to have people blaze their own trail mm. because credibility by proxy is seldom a reality. You don't become credible because you know somebody you try to do the same thing that somebody else was doing. Mm-hmm. Once you put your own personal take into those actions, then that's really when you come to be the leader that uh, others will desire to follow. But if I had to give them any advice, it will be to learn from the past, look at the place where they need to go early on. I was just having a conversation with a gunnery sergeant that has aspirations of being a sergeant major at some point. Mm -hmm. 12 years in service, so my advice was look at the next position that you're looking at filling, and that is that of a first sergeant. Then take some lessons learned from the past and start seeing what your strength and your weaknesses are. Then start charting a path, write it down on a notebook, in a notebook, and uh, start flying you know, your plan. As you get to execute that plan, you're gonna get to see that some things work, some fail, but use everything as a lesson learned, and then just keep on working forward. But always act on the expected rank and don't rest in your laurels because you are now an E7. Yeah. And if I had to give advice for any airman out there, if you are a master sergeant right now, start looking at that little brown book and see what it says about being a senior master sergeant and start acting in that fashion to go ahead and prove that you have the capabilities and the ability to be able to serve in that rank. Leave it no question that you are the best suited to do that. Yeah, no, that's sage advice, man. Um, This is a tough, very demanding job, requires a lot of travel. Uh, Prior to this, you were the senior enlisted leader for, the command senior enlisted leader for uh, AFRICOM, and I know uh, that required a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of energy, a lot of travel. How do you stay resilient, man? How do you maintain balance, harmony, whatever you want to call it? Uh, how do you keep yourself together? How do you keep yourself sane? Yeah, that's sanity. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I don't know about sanity. But I, I will tell you, and uh, this is a discussion that I had with my wife, Janet, uh, a few years ago. Because we were talking about, you know, our our you know, the length of our marriage, how long we've been together. And uh, two, two things always pop up when we're talking about, you know, our life, and that is uh, humility and humor. Mm. You know, um, we have always been grounded people, um, never let anything, every assignment has been the same. I report to senior officer, receive their orders, and then execute those orders to the best of my abilities for the time that I'm there. Not looking forward, not looking backwards, but learning every day. And then when things go wrong, even on the battlefield with my fellow uh, airmen, soldiers, sailors, uh, and Marines at, uh, at some time, uh, humor. Humor was a saving grace to everything that we did. We always found something to laugh about, even the worst of times. But uh, if I needed to pass any advice to anyone how to stay resilient, those are two things that ha- has helped me carry on. Yeah, my yeah. Life. I've, I've watched that in action, man. Uh, you know, we've been in several <laughs> classes, <laughs> meetings, and ga- I mean, we spend a lot of time together, and you always find a way to make us laugh, especially when we're <laughs> arguing and fussing and fighting about um, something. What about, t- do you have a morning routine, man? What, what do you do? Uh, one of the things that, I, that I've uh, learned over the years is, if you can master the mornings, uh, then you can, uh, nothing can guarantee success, but uh, you can at least put yourself on a path to be successful throughout the rest of the day. What, tell, me, tell me about your morning routine. Well, you know, so this is another conversation I have with my wife that we have become the old folks now because yeah. we go to bed super early, but there's a reason for that. Um, my day starts at 0345. That's when the alarm clock goes off. I get up. You know, pop a Red Bull, um, take some supplements, read yeah. my zipper net, you know, catch up with the with the news that I missed uh, mm-hmm. the night before. By uh, 05, I'm at the gym until 0615, come back, clean up, and then, you know, by 715, I'm at the steps of the river entrance, mm-hmm. and then the day goes on. Yeah. And then anything that happens throughout the day, I mean, it's just... Uh, 
relative to uh, the actions of that morning. If I do not PT, I'm cranky. Yeah. So I have to get my PT. It's just a habit that since I was a young airman, it's been ingrained in me. So if I don't do it, something is missing. But, you know, it gives me the, the energies and, and the focus that I need to be able to function early early in the morning. Yeah. So you're here at the steps of uh, the Pentagon 715, and uh, you got a lot of energy and a lot of focus. Uh, what things do you want to focus on as the, the next SEAC? Like what, what issues do you want to tackle during your time? So there are a lot of things that we need to get after uh, in my conversation with the chairman, with General Milley. But global integration is a big piece. Mm -hmm. You know, how we have the forces positioned to uh, be able to uh, react to any threat or to be able to attack. Uh, the national defense uh, strategy, line of effort number two, you know, building partnerships and attracting uh, new uh, partners, strengthening allies and attracting new partners. Mm -hmm. That is also a big focus because we know that we're not going to get after any conflict alone. We're going to have to rely on those partners. And then the third thing is is working with our people and their families, uh, looking at things that we can work with the services with you and uh, the MCPOM, MCPOG, Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, and the Sergeant Major of the Army, on finding uh, what has worked, what has not, and if it didn't work, what were the lessons learned so that we don't repeat that again. An example is the whole housing mm -hmm. uh, crisis that we need to put our heads together to be able to get after those those things, but the chairman is, is very, very critical about the way that we approach care and handle issues affecting the human capital, and that's uh, where my focus is going to be, the people. Yeah. Uh, that's good, man. I, I tell you what, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I, I won't be here for uh, the entirety of your your tenure, but uh, having worked together uh, in in the absent theater when when you were the absent C cell and, and I was in Afghanistan, and then uh, for the past few years, uh, working together in 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 this job uh, has just been fantastic. So I'm really looking forward to seeing all the great things that that you'll be doing for us. Hey, we got a part of the show where we like to take some questions from uh, the audience. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Senior Master Sergeant Harry Bubba Kibby, and uh, <laughs> he'll ask you a couple of questions from from the field. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Chief Siak, AJ, who is one of our 12 OAYs. Uh, asked on Twitter, he'd like to know, what can we do at the junior enlisted levels to align programs and processes with the NDS? So the first thing when you start talking about, you know, junior NCOs aligning with the NDS, I think we need to peel that back a couple of steps closer to what their responsibilities are. I don't want junior NCOs to start getting so focused on the strategic aspect of things to where they're losing sight of their core duties and responsibilities. And the reality is, is that there's a lot of service members out there that are even struggling to follow the simple rules imposed on them. So as NCOs, I will expect them to make sure that they're the keepers of the standard, making sure that people are doing what they're supposed to, do, uh, to be doing. Uh, obeying the rules and regulations and abiding by them, and most importantly, holding accountability to ensure that we have a disciplined force. If we do that, the NDS will play itself out. Awesome. Perry uh, asks kind of a similar question, and it's uh, how early should NCOs start developing a strategic mindset? I think uh, knowledge is pretty much open at any time in your career. If I needed to recommend two books for them to read if they want to know about strategy, is uh, The Art of War, Sun Tzu, and also Clausewitz, learning about the art and science of strategy. You know, the book is actually called On War. So read those two books. They can get a little bit dry at times, but just get past those few humps on the road, and you will come out with a pretty good understanding on what is it that it takes to create a strategy. But then I will urge them to go back to their units and start relating actions to what they read. There's nothing better than using education for action, not just knowledge. You know, nobody cares about hearing passages from Klausowitz's book. That's why I'm not quoting anything from it. Mm -hmm. But what I will tell you is that the actions taken based on what I learned from that has really helped me move along understanding the strategic uh, realm. Awesome, uh, Siak. Uh, Derek would like to know what is your favorite or most rewarding assignment as a leader? As a leader, I have to say AFRICOM. 
I got to learn so much in that theater. And I think a lot of people fall in the same pitfall I did, correlating, all right, we got terrorists just like Central Command, which is not. You get to deal a lot with poverty. You get to deal a lot with corrupt governments. I mean, there's, there's a whole government approach that is necessary to take care of the issues in Africa. But the one thing that I say it was most rewarding is my interaction with the African partners. A lot of them just needed a little bit of guidance to go ahead and be in power. And I think that we were able to achieve that because Chief Wright was there during the initial stages of our relationship building with them. But if you were to see them then and you see them now, they have flourished and even their, their chiefs of defense are empowering them more. They're creating positions for them, which is really a sign of success. You know, if, uh, since we're on the subject and for any young airmen uh, out there listening, I will say that when you get into an assignment, don't take someone's playbook and start acting upon it. Look at what they did and then go ahead and start developing what is it that the future needs. And that development of that particular playbook, your own playbook, it's got to have an end state, some actions that you want to see realized by the time you leave. And then you execute that plan. And then you use the people, not the feedback of those close to you, because there's going to be plenty of people blowing sunshine up your OCPs. But I will tell you, <laughs> that there's, there's one of those things that makes that chief right laugh. <laughs> I could have used some other choice words. But no, there's going to be plenty of people that are going to tell you, yes, 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 you're doing well. But when I look at the Africans' faces right now and I see what they're doing, man, that tells me success. And that is really what I would like uh, other people to be able to affect if they get put in positions of leadership. Awesome. But Thank that you. is why. Thanks, Jake. This last one is, is a selfish question. It's from Harry, Big Head Kibby. Uh, <laughs> I've heard you uh, mention it, and I know Chief Wright mentions that, that you were um, difficult as a young airman. Um, do you think that, so, on occasion, difficult airmen uh, who aren't given up on make good leaders? Well, I'm, I'm still difficult now. <laughs> he will tell you. <laughs> and, and one more thing is, is how do you encourage um, um, those in leadership positions not to give up on difficult troops? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you some of the story for the sake of time. But, I mean, getting in trouble at a young age, and the reason I'm here today is because one NCO decided to care for the issue. And I had two examples. One, my supervisor at the time that totally disregarded what happened. And then an outside agency NCO that actually took the time to go ahead and say, hey, what happened? Let me help you get back from this. And it was that one NCO that really gave me a plan to go ahead and be better than who I was at the time. When I finally became a tech sergeant and went through the NCO Academy, I ran into that NCO. And that NCO was a command chief at the time. And out of the blue, I, I saw her at the, at the club at Maxwell, and we still had a club over there. Mm -hmm. And I ended up having her uh, lunch with uh, her and her husband, John, who was a civil engineer in the Air Force. And uh, she was like a proud mom because she knew exactly how quick I had, pr uh, I had promoted, making up time for the stripe that I lost. Um, she saw that I was doing something better with my life. She saw that I actually taken my energy and made use of it. And then uh, when I finally became a chief master sergeant, she was one of the first people to go ahead and say congratulations, you know. And she told me, you see, Jack, you know, what's the <laughs> other word that we use for donkey? Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. she told me, uh, I told you so. You know, so again, if you fall on your face and pick yourself up, but realize that there's going to be somebody in there paying close attention to you. And if they give you advice to help, don't stay in the dumps, man. Don't stay in the basement. Yeah. You know, get out of there and freaking see the sunlight of the day because, man, every day will bring something different. So thank you very much, SIAC. And um, thank you for submitting the questions. If you'd like to connect with SIAC, you can follow his Facebook page at SIAC.JCS or on Twitter and at the joint staff. He's also on Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Back to you, Chief Wright. All right. Thanks, man. Um, hey, did you ever, was there ever a time uh, in your career growing up in the Air Force and in the joint world where you felt like giving up? Yes. Yes. And uh, most people will think during the pararescue pipeline, but uh, no, that wasn't even a thought at the time. But I had a very challenging assignment at one point, and uh, the, the assignment was challenging because at the speed 
that they were measuring progress was extremely slow. We had toxic leadership. We had uh, senior NCOs uh, that, for the most part, didn't care. Uh, there was a lot of self-serving going on at the time in that uh, particular assignment. And at one point, I actually called uh, my functional manager here at the Pentagon. I said, hey, I want out of active duty. Send me to the reserves over at Patrick. I'm done with this clown show. And uh, he's like, hey, buddy, just hang in there. Look, these things happen. Uh, just trust that somebody's got your back. And it is because I trusted that chief at the time that I decided to just go ahead and hold my ground. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad I listened because things really did materialize. Yeah. But uh, it was just a very, very difficult position. Man, I tell you, there's lots of, uh, and I'll, I'll just speak for airmen um, right now, but there are lots of airmen uh, out in our Air Force who are in that same position now. And you mentioned toxic leadership. So that's been a, a huge topic of discussion, um, not just on social media, but as I travel around the world and get to speak to young airmen and NCOs face to face, um, you know, they point to some of the resiliency challenges, the low morale, the suicide and, and some of the other things. Uh, one of the key things that they say is toxic leadership, toxic leadership. What, what advice would you give to um, a, a, a young airman or NCO who is dealing with, at least in their uh, opinion, who, who has to deal with a toxic leadership environment? How like what do you do? How do you make it through something like that? Well, I will tell them that it's all about accountability. If somebody's doing something wrong and they're that toxic, they got to be brought forward and mm -hmm. be dealt with. I've always said it, you deserve what you tolerate. So mm -hmm. if you let them keep doing that and uh, making you feel belittled or you know undervalued in your position, then you deserve it. Yeah. But if you decide to go ahead and stand up against them, and I I'll say it in, in public right now in the podcast, you can always reach out to me at any time. Yeah. Ramon that Colon Lopez that mail at mail that mail. And if you have an issue and you want some advice, reach out to me because the reason I'm here today is because one NCO took the time to go ahead and hear me out. And I will be uh, ashamed if I didn't hear you out if you're having similar issues. Yeah. Well, if your exec is listening, they better create another mailbox for you because <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll certainly start getting those. Uh, you, you speak from experience, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, what about, um, so there's a couple other parts of this equation that, that I would ask you to address. Uh, one is the, the person that's being a toxic leader, and, and let's, not, let's not even bother with them because th they probably are the ones who have this, most people who are toxic don't really, really know it. But what about the chiefs and the commanders and the folks that are responsible for making sure that you have the right leaders in the, in the right place and rooting out any, I always get this word, toxicity? Toxicity. Toxicity, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what would you say to those folks uh, who have the power to either make the toxic leader better or remove him from the organization? Yeah, my, my message will be the same, accountability. Uh, I, I think a lot of the issues we have today regarding leadership is lack of accountability. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that by that point, if you're talking about a wing command chief, a colonel, a uh, brigadier, they all know what the rules are. But often people turn to turn the blind eye, either because that has been the norm for a while, that has been the culture of the organization, or clearly they just don't feel they have time to be dealing with that. And sometimes people shy from opening the, the proverbial uh, can of worms because they got too much stuff to focus on. But my advice to them will be, if you're having problems with your people, you gotta put everything else aside and focus on them because without them, you will not get a damn thing done. Yeah. So pay close attention to, to your people and uh, see what their needs are. And if they bring something forward, then act upon it and show them the results that they're caring enough to go ahead and take care of the issues uh, immediately. Yeah. Hey, I got a, uh, a question for you, CZ. Um, so you literally are the poster child, like literally, like I, I come through the airport and I see your poster. I, uh, it, like you literally are. It wasn't the by poster. the FBI. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> like you're the poster child 
for you know what a service member, certainly an airman, should should look like, should act like, and if it you know if not for you telling your story, most people would think, wow, man, this guy's you know he's perfect, he's hardworking, he just gets after it, he's a machine, he wakes up at three forty-five in the morning. Um, tell us what you do for fun, though. Like what what are Besides making jokes about all the rest of us, what <laughs> like what do you and Janet do to on the weekends or when you have free time? So you know, I, I'll start with Janet because she just loves to make the home a home. She loves to cook, and that's part of our we time. You know, mm -hmm. we sit in the kitchen. You know, we have a beer. She cooks, and then we say whether the meal was great or it sucked. Which it never sucks, by the way. I'll say that <laughs> on the record. Um, and we love being outdoors. Yeah. Very uh, outdoorsy people. We love hiking. I obviously have a, a passion for mountaineering and mountain biking. Um, and she just loves being out there with me. And she's a hunter. Like sometimes she, we'll she, be in a class. We were at Harvard, I think, in a class together. Yeah. And you showed me pictures of her. I don't know if she had killed a mountain lion or a bear or. <laughs> yeah. By the time this is done, she's going to kill a freaking <laughs> Sasquatch. But, <laughs> but no, she's an avid hunter and uh, yeah. that is also uh, her passion. So she's very ascetic when it comes to it. Um, every year during the rut, right around Halloween, she has her sabbatical where she goes for about two and a half weeks and she hunts during that time. And that is the time that it, that is the respectful time of the year that you do not do anything with Janet. Right. She's wow. out there hunting, but no, but you know, that, uh, that passion, both of us understanding that, you know, we love the outdoors and there's certain things that we like to do. Like she hates mountain biking, mm -hmm. so she will not come out with me. And uh, I just got out of the penalty box too, by the way, because I almost yeah. killed myself uh, yeah, yeah, racing yeah. downhill. <laughs> but uh, but no, but you know we we allow each other uh, the time to do those kind of things, and uh, but most of the time we're just spending time together. And then again, as you know, our time with them is very limited, mm -hmm. so we maximize every opportunity that we get yeah. with them. Yeah, good. Uh, you mentioned two books uh, to uh, the audience on. You know things that you recommended them reading for strategy. What about you? What are you, what are you reading these days? So right now I'm doing my second read of, of uh, a book called "Let the Word Go Forth." Let the word go forth. Okay. By uh, Ted Sorensen, who mm -hmm. was uh, President Kennedy's uh, speechwriter. Okay. So what this book is about is uh, the speeches and uh, his dialogue letters from 1947 to 1963, and the book was written in 1991. But I've been uh, a disciple of uh, Kennedy's philosophy when it comes to uh, engaging people in public speaking, writing, and so on. So I've always uh, always been studying uh, the way that he did things. But uh, that book, uh, the reason I'm reading it for a second time now is because there's always a good uh, leadership nugget in there in between the key words, you know, be, you know beyond the... Do not ask what you know. Country can mm -hmm. do for you, the the typical ones that people hear. But uh, let the word go forth is uh, is one of those books to where people will find value. Yeah. So you, I think you got sworn in on Friday. You took your first trip uh, on Saturday to the Army Navy game. Uh, what about your first big big trip uh, beyond that? Where where are you going first? Who are the first service members you're gonna go visit? So the next uh, the next big. Uh, engagement that we have going on is uh, the beginning of the year and that is a USO tour so we're gonna go out overseas mm -hmm. uh, to different places to go ahead and engage with uh, with all of the forces and some of our international partners and then after that one of my main priorities is going to be to engage the professional military education academies for from all of the services okay and uh, part of that is that cultural learning to see where they are today and uh, see what is it that we can learn from each other, uh, not only for our U.S. personnel, but also building that, those partnerships with our allies. Um, and then uh, after that, uh, we have some total force engagements with the, with the National Guard, uh, our Coast Guardsmen, and then uh, a trip out to the Pacific. Yeah. True CZ fashion, you're a man that's got your priorities together, man. Ah, oh, man. Yeah, yeah it's, it's going to be, it's, <laughs> it, I'm telling you that we're heading out to the Pacific and uh, we definitely want to go ahead and hit everything while we're over there because I know that time is going to be limited, but uh, we're working through that right now. And then, you know, we have uh, engagements with the chairman to where we need access to certain places and, uh, 
he's uh, he's very inclusive. He's very empowering. He's uh, if you're with me, you're gonna be by my side. And he's also of the mindset that there's nothing between he and I. Yeah. He's like, if you need something from me, you come direct to me. Nobody in the staff will stop you, and uh, you do whatever you need to do. I tell you what, man, that makes a huge difference. I have a very empowering boss just like that. Yes. So, um, again, looking forward to all the great things. Uh, you mentioned that time is limited, so it's also limited for us. Uh, but I, I, I couldn't allow you to leave, man, without uh, telling us uh, of all the things that's happening in the world. Lots of challenging stuff. Uh, for us as leaders in the United States military, uh, what keeps you up at night, brother? Uh, well, getting up at 3.45 in the morning, <laughs> nothing keeps me up at night. You know, by 8 o'clock, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm sunk out. Yeah. But uh, something that is, uh, that is heavy on my heart and the back of my mind is uh, the, our posture when it comes to uh, helping people with uh, traumatic issues, uh, you know, brain issues, psychological issues. And uh, I go back to the conversation with uh, Chief Roy at the time that he was concerned about the well-being of the force. And we're starting to see it, mm -hmm. to, to see it right now. If you look at some of these young men and women, they have been getting after it for some of them over 15 years, going mm -hmm. back and forth, people in their 20th deployment. And uh, that's going to take a toll because it's not natural. And mm -hmm. when you're exposed to that much violence over a period of time, something is bound to go wrong. Yeah. And I definitely want to work with the services, with industry, and also with our allied partners to get to the best possible course of action to take care of them and make sure that that care doesn't stop when they leave service, that there's also some additional care once they depart, whether it's the VA or uh, other agencies, to be able to go ahead and help them out. But that is one thing that is, uh, that is heavy on my mind. Yeah, no, man, I, I appreciate it. I, I, can, I can tell you, uh, for the audience out there, uh, we definitely uh, hit the lottery with uh, SEAC number four, man. So, so thanks for all the stuff that you've been doing all throughout your career, and and I and I look forward to just watching you, man. I'm I'm just gonna sit back and, and watch you work. Uh, I'll, I will give you one last uh, opportunity, man. To uh, any any message that you want to leave to to the team about uh, leadership or life or or any topic of your choice. Well. Talking about the Ted Sorensen book, I actually have a quote that I wrote in my book back, you know, a few uh, a few months back, and uh, I would like to share that with you. Yeah, and this is uh, from the president's inaugural speech, uh, and the passage is called "Let the Word Go Forth," and it says, "Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans." born this century, tempered by war, disciplined by hard and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage and unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we're committed today at home and around the world. Then he continues to say, let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and success of liberty. When you read those words, and this is decades and decades ago, they still relate to every single one of us as Americans today. And if you're looking for a purpose to serve, just pay close attention to the words of the people that laid the path for us, whether it's in space, or in the battlefield. We have a lot of role models and a lot of good lessons learned in our history. So keep getting educated, keep getting smart, but most importantly, take action when you get after it. Yeah, thanks, man. Uh, you certainly have laid the path and the foundation for many of us and many uh, airmen and service members uh, alike that'll, that'll come up behind you. So thanks again for, for what you do. Um, well, that wraps up this session, uh, ladies and gentlemen. But before I go, uh, let's take a minute to thank, uh, of course, our guest for today, uh, SEAC number four, CZ Colon Lopez. Um, I also want to thank, say thanks to all the folks who submitted questions uh, through the various social media outlets. Uh, our team from SAF PA, Mr. Tony Young, uh, Juan Femeth, Sergeant Walton, Sergeant Shinzato, and my big giant headed. Uh, PA advisor, senior master sergeant Harry Bubba Kibbe. 
And uh, lastly, thank you to all the current and future leaders out there for listening in and for being on the front lines and taking care of your teams. If you'd like to find out more, check with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. This has been your Blueprint Leadership Podcast. Thanks for listening. And remember, if better is possible, good is never enough. And you are your greatest competition.